glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name. Oh, I am so wondrously saved from sin, Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me, oh, sing glory to his name. Glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet, cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Lord Jesus, we come before you tonight, so thankful we can come to this place. Father, we can gather in your name and we can worship you. I pray tonight, Father, that as our praises do you go up, that your Holy Spirit, he will come down and fill this place. Lord, I pray that as Brother Jim stands to, to preach and to teach us from your word, Lord God, that you will speak to our hearts, that you will show us things from your word, that you will convict us of our sin and you will uh, change us to be more like Jesus. We love you today, Lord. Thank you, Father, that in times like these we have a Savior like Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Let's continue to sing. Standing on the promises. Oh, standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fears assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of Christ my Savior. Standing, standing on the promises, I'm standing on the promises of God. Promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of Christ my Savior. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God. Give the Lord praise. Above all powers, above all. Of all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all Above all wonders this world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there 
is no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified, laid behind a stone, you lived and died, rejected and alone like a rose, trampled on the Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders this world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, oh, there's no way to measure what you're worth. Lay behind the stone You live to die Rejected and alone Like a rose Trampled on the ground You took the fall And thought of me Above all Worthy is 
you guys. What a beautiful old song. That's been a long round, a long time. Is that a Gloria, Bill and Gloria Gaither song, Brian? Yeah, praise the Lord. Good to see everybody here tonight. Amen. Been a wonderful Lord's Day, Amen. my brother. Been, been an awesome day today. Thank you, Jesus. Got a text from one of the young ladies that got saved this morning. She's going to be baptized next um, Sunday, so that's a praise the Lord. So God is moving and working in spite of us. We just say to God be the glory. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians, please, chapter 2. 2 Corinthians, chapter 2. Hope when you came in tonight, you got an outline entitled Satan's Fourfold Plan. Uh, if you do not have an outline, would you raise your hand? Our men will be sure to get you one. Everybody got one? Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians, chapter 10. 2 Corinthians, chapter 2, excuse me. Satan's fourfold plan. Hey, Dave, man. Guys, I want you to be sure to meet Brother Tony right here. This young man, I've known him since he was a little, little boy. He's a grown man, got his family. This is Terry and Shirley Smith's son. And Terry and Shirley were uh, one of our faithful members at First Baptist Church, Saxe, worked in the nursery and preschool. And Brother Terry was one of our original trustees, one of the 14 members that helped start this church. And Brother Tony, just him and his wife, where do y'all live, Brother Tony? We're Cattle, Mills. Cattle Mills. And so uh, they're going to start coming visit us on Sunday nights. Yeah. So uh, they just, uh, this is a Jesus deal. We love you, Tony. Be sure to tell your wife and your family we said hi. Uh, Second, Second Corinthians chapter 2. We missed last Wednesday night, and I thank Brother Michael McNary, and praise God, he always does such a wonderful job for Jesus. Him and Rob, we praise the Lord for them guys. We went to Austin, Kathy and I, to see our grandkids. We hadn't been there since the pandemic. They've been here, but we hadn't been there. And uh, my daughter, granddaughter Tiffany, named after our daughter who passed away, uh, she had a recital. So we got to go to that recital Friday night and enjoy, enjoy and be with the kiddos and uh, Loving on them and uh, Christian and Hannah. And uh, then they'll be in this weekend because Hannah graduates from North Texas State Friday, our, our granddaughter-in-law. So uh, it's been a, been, a, been a good week. And we thank, on the spur of the moment, I called Brother Michael. Brother Rob was in Midland, Texas. Called Brother Rob. Uh, Michael and asked if he could preach for us Wednesday. And 
he did, and we thank you, my brother. We love you uh, for that. Um, so we've got to catch up one of our studies on spiritual warfare. And uh, this next Wednesday night, if Jesus tarries, we're going to do a message on titled Five Words, Just Five Words to Overcome Temptation. You know, something we all have in common, even with Jesus, is temptation. Say amen to that. That's something we have in common, even with Jesus. For the Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all ways such as we, yet without sin. There are five words in the Bible that will help us with this matter of temptation. Um, James talks about us being tempted, being enticed. You'll see it in James chapter 1, verse 14, Carl. He talks about being enticed. That is a fishing term. And let me tell you, Satan is a master fisherman when it comes to tempting God's people. He knows just what bait he can use on you and he can use on me. Are you out there, please? The bait that he may use on me, he may not use on you. But Satan is the master fisherman. And is, the Bible talks about us being enticed. And it's like a fish, a fisherman fishing. The bait is dropped. You don't, you don't put the hook in the boat. You got to put it where the water is, amen, where the fish are. The bait is dropped. The bait is desired. The bait is devoured. Those fish swallow it. The bait brings death. That's exactly the way it works in our lives with temptation. The bait's desired. That temptation's there. The bait's desired. We look too long. Just like King David. You know, that first look was not sin, but that second look was sin. The bait was dropped with King David. The bait was desired when he saw Bathsheba bathing. Ultimately, the bait was devoured and ultimately, the bait brought death to King David as far as his spiritual testimony. And so, Wednesday night, we're going to go fishing. And we're going to look at God's Word. And there are five words that the Bible gives us to overcome temptation. So we look forward to that Wednesday night if Jesus tarries. Um, I'm excited about it. Let's stand in honor of God's word together. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and those who are online, we welcome you tonight to our evening service. Grateful you've joined in with us. Hope you have an outline there with you. Your Bible's open to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. God's word says this, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Satan would love to get an advantage of you He'd love to get an advantage of me. He'd love to get an advantage of this nation that was founded by God just like Israel. Founded by God and on God's word, that's America. Are you out there, please? America was founded by God and America was founded on God's word. But Satan has taken advantage of a nation that's taken its eyes off Jesus and put them on the world. Lest Satan takes advantage of us. Don't be ignorant of his devices. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let's all pray this prayer together tonight. Everyone praying with me from your heart and from your lips. Dear Jesus, please speak to my heart tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Satan has a strategy to dominate and to destroy this world morally and spiritually. And guess what? It's working well. Because many of God's people are ignorant concerning Satan's devices and his schemes and his plans. But he has a fourfold plan to dominate this world and destroy our nation morally and spiritually. I want you to notice these are stair- like uh, climbing a ladder, guys. Look up here. These four steps are like climbing a ladder. You climb the first one, then it leads to the second one. Climb the second one, leads to the third one. Climb to the third, climb the third one, leads to the fourth one. And let me tell you, Satan has a fourfold plan to dominate our nation morally and spiritually, and it's working. 
I want you to notice number one, to destroy our country morally and spiritually, he wants to debase man or debase God. Excuse me, dethrone God. He wants to dethrone God. You say, how do you dethrone God? I'm not, you can never dethrone God from his throne, but he can try to dethrone God from men's hearts and their minds. He does that through what it was, was called years ago, humanism. Now we call it secularism. It is a movement in America. If you look at your outline, it's, secularism or humanism is nothing new. Satan tried it in the Garden of Gethsemane, or Garden of Eden when he told Eve in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 that even you can be like God. So that secularism, look up here guys, secularism isn't something new that just started with the Democratic Party recently. It's been around a long, long time. The Democratic Party has bought into it as well as many Republicans. If you look at your outline. Secularism has permeated America today. First of all, from our White House, especially right now. With secular bills and laws that Joe Biden is trying to cram down our throat. Secularism has begin, begun in the White House. Then it goes to the courthouse. And now is it in our schoolhouses. Secularism is being taught in our schools today across America. Simply defined, if you look at your outline, secular, secular, secularism defined as simply a man-centered religion that attempts to solve the problems of man and the problems of the world independently of God. Secularists act like there is no God. As a matter of fact, they put those doubts in the minds of our young people in college and even in our high schools. They'd have young people to think, did God create man or did man create God? Secular humanism is a man-centered religion that attempts to solve the world's problems and man's problems independently from the Word of God, the Son of God. They have nothing to do with the things of God. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ism that has permeated our society today. Look at your outline, please. Secularism would have our young people to believe that God is a figment of man's imagination. That's what they put in the hearts and minds of our young people. Did man create God or did God create man? Number two, if he can give people believe in secularism, which our America has, by the way, has swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. Our country has swallowed that hook, line, and sinker. But if, we, if he can get America to, to dethrone God in the mi minds of man, in the hearts of our young people, the second step is he will deny or debate, debase, debase man through evolution. You see, if you can get people to think there's no God, then evolution just falls right in place. You don't need God for evolution. You see, it started years ago. It's very slow. It's just Satan's like an angel light. It, 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 these things begin to work very slow. And you know what? Uh, if, if he can get people thinking there's no God, then why, why do you have to have creation? He wants to demace man through a theory called evolution. In 18, look at your outline. In 1809, Charles Darwin hatched an egg from hell called evolution. In 1963, write it down in your outline, please. Many of y'all were just babies then or wasn't born. But in 1963, the Supreme Court took creation out of our public schools, as I mentioned this morning, and brought the monkey story in. That's in 1963. The evolutionist, the secularist, would you look at your outline, the liberals of this country have sabotaged the Bible. They've sabotaged God's word. You can't have God's word in our schools anymore. They sabotage the Bible. They've humanized God. Keep writing. They've deified man. They deified man. Man can become a God. That's what Mormonism teaches. You can ultimately become a God yourself. They've deified man. They've minimized sin. Oh, it's no big deal. Notice, they've glorified greed. They have glorified greed. They've glamorized sex and they've liquorized our country. 
morally and spiritually. By the way, this has all happened since I was a little boy. Look up here, guys, and it starts real slow. Now it's going faster and faster and faster every day. A society or a nation, look up here, church, who believes in any form of evolution is going to have a threefold problem. Would you write it down? First of all, they're going to have a scriptural problem. They're going to have a scriptural problem. Anybody who believes the monkey story is going to have a problem with this book right here. Say amen to that. Fill in the blanks. If God's word can't be trusted to tell us about the origin of the species, God's word can't be trusted to tell us about the destiny of the species. You need to say amen to that, folks. If God's word cannot be trusted to tell us about the origin of the, of the species, that man was created in the image of God, you can't trust the Bible to tell us about the destiny of the species. Keep filling in the blanks. It takes, look up here, it takes far greater faith to believe the monkey story than it does God's simple truth of God's word in Genesis 1-1 that says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Just 10 words. It takes far greater faith to believe that man came out of a slime pit somewhere and beginning is still involved, evolving. You know, it takes far greater faith to believe that monkey story than it does God's word that says, Plainly, black print on white paper, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Fit on the blanks at the bottom of your outline. The evolutionists believe that time plus chance. Evolutionists believe and they tell our young people that time plus chance can turn frogs into professors. That's the truth too. If you believe that, I nearly said the C word, but I'm gonna, if you believe that junk, let me tell you friends, You gotta be a moron. We were created in the image of God. You got a big time problem with this book right here if you believe in evolution. But you know what? Most of our schools in America, that's all they teach and that's what they've been teaching since 1963. They have indoctrinated our young people to the point that they believe the monkey story. And now with the Democrats in power, if you don't believe it, you're a racist. Amen. Idiots. Excuse me. I didn't apologize. I just said, excuse me. <laughs> Guys, let me tell you, a society or a person, a school that teaches that as the truth, evolution, is going to have a scriptural problem. Number two on the back of your outline, a, a, a nation's going to have a problem, a salvation problem. You're going to have a big time salvation problem if you believe the creation story. Because you see, if there was no creation, man evolved, look up here. If man evolved like the evolutionists tell us, that means there was no creation. You don't need a creation if man's been evolving. If, 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 if you believe in evolution, there's no creation. Just keep following it. If there was no creation, there was no Adam and Eve. If there was no Adam and Eve, there was no Garden of Eden. If there's no Garden of Eden, there was no fall of man. There's no such thing as original sin. If there's no such thing as original sin, then you know what? Jesus died in vain. Look at your outline and write it down big and write it down plain. The evolutionists would have you to believe that what man needs is a boost from below. They're teaching our young people you need a boost from below. God's word says what we need is a birth from above. Say amen to that, guys. Evolutionists say what man needs is a boost from below. God's word says what we need is a birth from above. You must be born again. A society or a nation like America who's swallowed hook, line, and sink evolution not only has a scripture problem, not only does it have a salvation problem, but we have a society problem. Just follow the logic of evolution. Just look around. Today in America, we're reaping the hellish results 
of teaching our children that they came from animals. Would you write down 1980, please? Oh, no, excuse me. 1963, it's already in your outline. In 1963, when the Supreme Court took creation out and brought evolution in for 57 years now, how many years? 57 years they've been teaching our children, you came from an animal. You came from an animal. You came from an animal. And guess, guess what, guys? If you come from an animal, they're now acting like animals. The monkeys are running the zoo. The monkeys are running the zoo now. Satan has a fourfold plan to dominate this, our nation, especially America, morally and spiritually. He wants to dethrone God through secularism. He wants to debase man through a hellish theory called evolution. But just follow the logic. The next thing is in step. He wants to deny Christian morals. You see, if you don't believe in God, then there's no absolutes. You see, you see how it works, guys? He can't start denying Christian morals until he gets a country thinking there is no God. Until he gets a country thinking there's no such thing as creation. And it just follows logic. If he can dethrone God in the hearts and minds of man, debase man through evolution, then guess what? Here we are, folks. Where are, let me ask you, where are the morals of our country anymore? He's trying to destroy this, destroy this nation by undermining the traditional values of home, family, and our nation. And he's doing a good job now. Say amen to that, church. 1980, would you write that in your outline? In 1980, the Supreme Court took the Ten Commandments out of our public schools. 1980. Some of you weren't even born in 1980. 1963, evolution. 1980, let's take the Ten Commandments out of the... That's how it follows, guys. Just follow the logic. That's what Satan's doing taking the Ten Commandments. Now look up here, church. There are no more morals in this nation. We used to walk into school. We had prayer. We saluted and pledged allegiance to the flag. And there was the Ten Commandments on the walls. Back in the 50s, all the Dallas public schools had a New Testament class that was required for you to take because I got the book in my office. You were required to take New Testament in Dallas public schools in the 1950s. It was required to take a New Testament study in the Dallas Independent School District in the 50s. I've got the, I've got the books. But they take the Ten Commandments out, anything goes, guys. It's situation ethics. If it feels good, do it. You can no longer tell a young person what's right and what's wrong. That's straight from hell. You see, when the Ten Commandments are on the wall, look up here, church, that is absolute. There's no argument, thou shalt not kill. Honor your father and your mother. Today, yesterday, Steve told me another young person, 19 years old, stabbed his mother and stabbed his sister to death. They called him at DFW Airport this, this afternoon, this, the day, I guess, Steve, Called him today at DFW, fixed to get on the airport, get on the airplane. Two weeks ago in Allen, those two boys had that suicide pact, killing their entire family, wiping them out. Let me tell you, where's honor your father and your mother? They're going to school and they're, you don't have to, our kids can get an abortion without their parents knowing it now in America. You don't have to get your parents' permission for anything. It's a plan, folks. You couldn't do nothing without your parents' permission when we were growing up. You got a whip in the school, they called your mom and dad, so they made sure you got one when you got home. Say amen to that. Not anymore. They can't discipline these kids. There's nothing right or wrong anymore. And our kids are praying a heavy price. This is the age, look, look at things that used to amaze us in America now amuse us. Things that used to amaze us now amuse us. When I heard of somebody being homosexual, that amazed me when I was a boy. I never heard of anything like that. Are you out there, please? Now they have more rights than we do. 
Things that used to slink down our alleys now strut down our streets and everybody's applauding them. Let me tell you, friends, sin is still sin in God's eyes. He loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. But we can get away with anything with transgender and all the other junk going on today. We're just letting it go by. Pulpits are silent. Not teaching our children. I said one reason again, we're striving to have a Christian school here starting in September. Thank God for those public school teachers who are still teaching the truth. And many of them are going to get fired for it. Many of them have. We've had superintendents of schools who've been laid off or fired because of their stand on the word of God. You had a man speak here just several years ago from Lovejoy. Are you listening to me, Brian? Let me just tell you something, friends. We're living in a day that morals, there's no more morality. Billy Graham said this, look up here. Before he died, Billy Graham said, God will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah if he does not judge America. And I remind you that Sodom and Gomorrah had not one Bible in their towns. There was not one Bible in Sodom and Gomorrah and God rained fire down on it. If you want to teach that LBGT, we'll start with the Genesis about Sodom and Gomorrah. I need some help, please. You want, to teach, you want to teach that? We'll start in the book of Genesis and see what God's word has to say about it. It's not a sin that God can't forgive because he can, but it's a sin that God hates. There's not a dendron in this book that it's okay to shack up with one another, to live like animals. We're going to hell as a nation and I'm not going to be silent about it. It's a dirty, rotten shame. America is quickly sinking in the quicksands of immorality. And we just wink our eyes at it, turn our back on it. Don't say nothing. Don't, don't rock the boat, preacher. We got to stand up and preach the truth of God's word, Tony. And that's what we're going to do. I don't have many years left. I could care less. God's allowed me to live a long life, a good life, in spite of my rotten self. Let me tell you, but I'm going to preach until God calls me home. When God's through with me here, I'll be back at Victory Church because I'm still on staff there as their staff evangelist. I'll be preaching every Sunday night back there and preaching somewhere in America. I'm going to preach till God calls me home. If they, my wife puts me in a nursing home, come and visit me, I'll preach you a sermon. I'm going to keep preaching. That's my life and has been since 1967, 1968. Let me just tell you, my friends, we got to stand up for America. Again, that's why I love Donald Trump. I'll say it again. I love Donald Trump. I don't care if you like the man or not. He stood up for what's right. He stood against abortion. He stood up for home and family, unlike Biden and Harris. He stood up for Israel. That better bother you. And I'm not going to turn my back and wink at what's going on. If people hate me, so be it. I don't, get, I don't care. We ain't got nothing to prove. We just got someone to please. Amen. Guess what? When you please him, it don't matter who you displease. And if you displease him, it don't matter who you please down here. It's sure a lot easier to please one man than a bunch of Baptists. This is the age, look at your outline, because of no morals anymore in this nation. This is the age of permissiveness. Anything goes now. Can I have some help, please? Y'all don't live here? This is the age of permissiveness. Anything goes. It's an age number two of perversion. Anything goes. Age of permissiveness. Perversion and an age of pleasure. Do you know what 2 Timothy 3, 4 says? Look up here. Paul lists 18 signs of the last days. He said, these 18 signs, right before Jesus comes, just, just keep your eyes on these 18 signs because when these things, you see these things happen, you lift up your head for your redemption draweth nigh. And one of those signs in 2 Timothy chapter 3, read it in verses 1 through 8. 
One of those signs is this. Men will become lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So we can fill up football stadiums. We can fill up soccer fields. We can fill up baseball stadiums. We can't fill up God's house. We can fill up Walmart. Can't come to God's house. This is age of pleasure. Lift up our heads for our redemption draweth nigh. Remember the ladder we're climbing. You can't climb the second ring until you got up the first one. Satan wants to dethrone God. We've swallowed that as a nation, which led to the next step on the ladder. Debased man. We bought into that hellish theory called evolution. The third ring, you deny Christian morals. What's happened in this nation? The number four, his ultimate target, his ultimate target is destroy our homes. That is his ultimate target. Same into that church. The home is the foundation of America, not the church. I need some help, please. Our government is not the foundation of America. It's not the church. The foundation of a nation is the home and family and marriage. As goes the home, family, and marriage, so goes a nation. Satan loved to destroy our homes. One of the signs that we're living in the last days, Jesus gives it to us in Matthew 24. The disciples ask him, how will we know we're living in the last days? And Jesus says, as the days of Noah were, so all shall, so all sh so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. You studied Noah's day, there was a multiplicity of marriages. They didn't last long in Noah's day. Well, I got news for you. They're not lasting long anymore in America. The divorce rate for the first time in the history of America is as high in the church as it is outside the church. There's just as many divorces that people attend church on Sunday morning as people who never attend church. We're living in the last days. Fill in the blanks. What many couples think is a highway to happiness. What many couples today in America think is a highway to happiness. It's nothing but a road to ruin because they've left Jesus out of their hearts, their lives, their homes, and their families. This couple down here this morning, Sean Caldwell, who got saved several weeks ago, planning to get a divorce from his little wife. They've been having big time marital problems. She had want nothing to do. They, by the way, they drive all the way from Sulphur Springs. So eat your heart out, Tony. But look up here, guys. <laughs> that little couple's here from Sulphur Springs. Planning to get a divorce. Can't do it. Can't put up with it anymore. What he likes, she don't. Well, this morning, God solved that problem because she got saved. Amen. Then she texted me this afternoon and said, I want to be baptized Sunday. God can build up and restore the home and marriage where the locusts have eaten away. Say amen to that. A lot of couples, what they think is a highway to happiness is but a road to ruin because they've left Jesus out of their hearts, their homes, their families, and marriages. Look at the key thought there. Fill in the blanks under key thought. Are you with me? A marriage made in heaven. Say that back to me. Still takes maintenance here on earth. There's a great echo in here. I love that echo. A marriage made in heaven still takes maintenance here on earth. It takes work to make a marriage work. It's not going to be easy. We're living in a nation that's anti-families, anti-marriage, anti-homes. We're living in a society where the devil is attacking with his most fiery darts our homes and marriages. Well, the latest statistics is this. People that have been married over 30 years are now divorcing as a fast of rate as those who just got married. It's amazing. People who have been married over 30 years are now getting divorces. Satan wants to destroy our homes and families. Look at your outline. Four keys to a marriage made in heaven. Number one, it takes the right person. And his name's Jesus. Guys, I wouldn't give you a half a hallelujah chance for your marriage working without Jesus. It's going to be hard enough with him. Satan's going to see to that. 
to have a marriage made in heaven takes the right person. It takes the Lord Jesus. Psalms 27 verse 1 says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Ecclesiastes 3 says, a threefold cord is not easily broken. And when you have a husband and wife in Jesus, that's a threefold cord that's not easily broken. I used to think marriage took two, but not anymore. It takes three. You can't do it. Understand where we're living and what day we're living, the age we're living in, friends. We're living in the last days. These are signs that Jesus is coming soon. To have a marriage made in heaven takes a right person. His name's Jesus. Number two, it takes a right perspective. Is that right? It takes a right perspective on what real love is. It takes more than moonlight and roses to make a marriage last. Say amen to that, guys. The moon will soon go down and the roses will soon fade away. It takes more than moonlight and roses to make a marriage last. It takes the gift of love that only Jesus can give a family and it's called agape love. Agape love. It's the kind of love that Jesus had on the cross when he died for your sins and mine. He had agape love for you that says, I love you in spite of your faults. I love you in spite of your flaws. I love you in spite of your failures. Say amen to that. Amen. We've takes that kind of love for one another. I love you in spite of your faults. I love you in spite of your flaws. I love you in spite of your failures. And let me say this. Only a perfect husband can demand a perfect wife. And there's no such animal. See, I just fell into evolution. A perfect husband can demand a perfect wife, but there's no such thing. And a perfect wife cannot demand a perfect husband, for there's no such thing. We've got to agape one another. Now let me tell you guys, that eros love, that love between a husband and wife, that young love, enjoy it while you can. That's all going to change. You better agape one another, my friends, because that lasts forever. Kathy and I were blessed to have parents who both lived, married over 50 years and showed Kathy and I how to love one another. Our parents loved us unconditionally. They loved one another unconditionally. And I pray that I'll be handing down that same tradition to my children and my grandchildren. Say amen to that. Amen. To have a marriage made in heaven, it takes the right person, a right perspective. And number three, it takes a right plan. A right plan. You know, when you're going to build a house, you go... You'll go to an architect and he makes some plans. Are you out there, please? You just don't throw a bunch of sticks out there and put cement. He, he's got a plan to build you a nice home that's going to last. Well, look up here, guys. Here's God's plan for your home. He's the architect of it. He's the one that gave us the home in marriage. And you can build your life, your home, and your future on God's eternal word. Tomorrow, tomorrow, April 26, Kathy and I will celebrate our daughter's 18th anniversary when Tiffany went home to be with Jesus. And let me tell you, friends, whether it's 18 years or eight days ago, it don't matter to us. You build your life, your home, your family, the good times, the bad times on this book right here. It sees you through the rough times. It takes a right plan. And Jesus talked about the wise man who built his house on the rock and the storms came. We preached on that several weeks ago. And in your home, the home stood because it was built on the Word of God. Got to build our lives, our homes and families on God's inerrant, infallible, invincible, indestructible, inspired Word of God. You can do it. To have a marriage made in heaven, number one takes what? Number one, to have a marriage made in heaven, it takes a what? Number two? Number three? And everybody knows number four, much, much prayer. Much, much prayer. Families that pray together, stay together. Thank God for the Knights of Columbia, you Catholic folks. 
Oh, no. <laughs> Knights of Columbia for years and years had them signs all over America on old Highway 80, Route 66, and all those old interstates back in the day. They took them down a long time ago, guys. And look what's happened. Families that pray together stay together. I don't care how hard Satan tries. Greater, than he, greater is he that's in us than he's in this world. But we need to be aware. Look up here, church. We must be aware of his plans, his schemes, and his desires, his devices. We're living in a day when we've seen all four happen in our lifetime. We've seen it happen in our lifetime. In our lifetime. From dethroning God with humanism and secularism. My grandparents, my parents never heard of stuff like that. Never heard of nothing like that. To debasing man through evolution. Didn't start happening until 1963. Then to deny Christian morals in 1980, take the Ten Commandments out. And now look at our homes and our families today. Families that pray together, stay together. And friends, for the sake of our children and grandchildren, us parents and grandparents need to be praying like we never prayed before for our families. We've got to do it. Because guess who's paying the price? The children. God wants you and I to have three homes. God wants you and I to have three homes, three F's. He wants you to have a home for your family where he's Lord. He wants you to have a home for your faith, your church family where Jesus is Lord. And he wants you to have a future home with him in heaven where Jesus is Lord. He wants us to have those three kinds of homes. And you can when Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm going to ask every head to be bowed and every eye to be closed. Every head bowed and every eye closed. As Kathy begins to play the piano. Tonight this message has been primarily to us as Christians. It's about spiritual warfare. Lost people don't understand this. This message is primarily for God's people, for me, for you. And if you're here tonight or you're watching online, you've been struggling about your commitment to Jesus, whether you have one or not, then friends, you need to settle that tonight. You need to give your heart and life to Jesus and get on with the rest of your life, please. Jesus has been dealing with your heart like he did with those five folks that got saved here this morning. Many of them have been struggling for weeks, they said. But they settled it once and for all. They gave their heart and life to Jesus. And they can go on now with the rest of their lives. And if you're not sure you ever made a commitment to Jesus tonight, we're gonna give you that opportunity, whether you're online or whether you're here at Cornerstone. God's word says that whose service shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. And if you'd like to do that, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer silent in your heart as I pray it out loud right now. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Without you, I know I'm lost. But tonight, Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Right now, Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving my soul. In Jesus' name. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you're at home, you prayed that prayer, God bless you. We have a young lady who's manning the phones here at Cornerstone. There's a number on your screen. Would you call that number? Let us know you made that decision. We'd like to rejoice with you. Welcome you to the family. If you're here tonight at Cornerstone, you prayed that prayer, made that commitment to Jesus in your heart as a testimony to him, you're not ashamed. Would you raise your hand, anybody here? Praise the Lord. Church, look up here now. I'm proud of this young lady here. Does anybody know who this young lady here is? Come here, sweetie. Y'all know who this young lady here is? 
love this young lady. Donovan and his wife, this is Donovan's mother-in-law. She got saved just a few weeks ago. She wanted to come back tonight and learn about spiritual warfare. She's a brand new baby Christian. Don't overlook these people when they walk in. You hug their necks, please. We gotta lift them up to Jesus. Pray them in. We're grateful for this young lady's life. We're gonna have special prayer tonight for David Seaton. He begins his chemotherapy in the morning. He's very, very sick. He's had a headache now for some time. Uh, he's not feeling well, but he begins tomorrow morning his chemotherapy. Diane's out there. Can somebody go get Diane and just relieve her so we can pray for Diane? It's going to be every day, folks. We've got to lift Diane up to as well. And while we pray for David Seaton, I want to pray for Jan Botterford. She fell this last week and broke her tailbone. And we need to pray for Jan. She's still going, doing her chemotherapy. But I want to lift up Jan Botterford. What a trooper she is. I want to continue to pray for Shorty Dillard. He got a great CT scan. We're going to rejoice and thank God for that. Guys, we need to pray for one another. Pray for our families, our children and grandchildren. Pray for our new Christians. We love you, sweetie. Stay right up here because I want folks to get around you. Uh, let's stand up, guys, and get together. With all this side right here, y'all, guys, hey, you men, hey, Stacy, y'all come over here with everybody right here. Let's group on this side. Let's all get together here, guys. Let's pray for David Seaton. Pray for Jan Botterford. And pray for Brother David. Brother Shorty, come here, sweetie girl. Like the we love you. We're praying for David Mar Bay. Don't get around her, guys. Let's pray. My God. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, let all heaven and earth proclaim. all pass away but there's something about that name Jesus Jesus oh Jesus oh there's just something about that name 